my room. Shit, I'm still in my room. Every time I think I'm going to wake up back in the jungle. Every minute I stay in this room, Willard Maxing, I get weaker, and the algorithm just gets stronger. Hell, I don't even care about views. I'm making art here. I share goofy facts and opinions with my 20 viewers. Each time I look around, the walls move in a little tighter. Bullshit piled up on the internet so fast you needed wings to stay above it. Everyone gets what you want. I wanted to make a video, and for my sins, they let me create one. Before I get on with this, I have to mention that I have to re-upload this whole thing because for some reason the publishing studio behind Apocalypse Now has content ID blocked uh, all clips of Apocalypse Now and I had to fucking repla replace every single one of them with uh, gameplay from uh, Rising Storm Vietnam, so, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, enjoy. In the past couple of weeks, I've been seeing more and more Apocalypse Now themed videos. It really made me want to talk about this movie. A movie which I thought I would never talk about. I felt like I couldn't do justice to the movie by making a video about it. I put it on a pedestal. For this video, I assume that you have seen the movie. If you haven't, go and watch it because it's really good and because this video will not be spoiler free. There's nothing in my video that isn't already out there, but my opinion on it. I guess I kind of want to explain my own opinions a bit with this video and also, and also encourage you to research this film a little because the background of it is very, very interesting and Things that I'll cover in this are, well, they're just the tip of the iceberg. When I watch this movie, it makes me feel like I'm living it. I've talked about the Vietnam War a lot on this channel before. I feel like it, along with the rest of the Cold War, is some of the most fascinating times in human history. The brutality of this war, yet the secrecy around everything, made it so interesting. Mac V. Sog's involvement in Cambodia, or the fact that the US used Sog's fuckups to their advantage and got officially involved in the war, only to hide the truth which is what makes this one of the most interesting conflicts in history. At the end of the Second World War, Vietnam was divided to ease the deoccupation of Japanese troops in Indochina. Fans to whom Vietnam belonged to, as it had been a colony of the French, was weakened in the war, so the the task of occupying Vietnam was left to the other allies. However, one general, a sea of irradiated cobalt, MacArthur, wanted Tokyo to surrender before the allies would be sent to Vietnam. This proved to be a mistake, as in all the chaos that the Japanese had caused, the communists had seen an opportunity to do a coup. Long story short, the French went back in, took control, then things went to shit, then an insurgency began striking back at the French. Then, the French were like, We will fuck it, here is an independent Vietnam, but it's controlled by this guy. And then, the conflict turned into a conventional war, with the US and allies backing south, and the Soviets and their buddies backing north. The US joins the war to hopefully achieve more allies in Asia, compared to the USSR and China, and BOOM! The Vietnam War. We are in grave danger from the com- To most, the US wasn't the good guy. Even to a lot of Americans, the US wasn't the good guy in Vietnam. Shady involvement in a war that is not really their business. The draft, the civilian deaths, the improper handling of trauma. Let me be clear, most people in the US, contrary to popular belief, did not treat the veterans like shit after they came back. The United States ended up pulling out of Vietnam between 1973 and 1975 when Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City, fell. 
A famous director by the name of Francis Ford Coppola, at the time known for his film The Godfather, set out to create a movie based on the Vietnam War and the 1899 novel Heart of Darkness, which I have also mentioned in my Spec Ops The Line video. The biggest and most obvious ones would be the 1899 novel by Joseph Conrad, The Heart of Darkness, and the 1979 war film by Francis Ford Coppola, Apocalypse Now. Together with John Milius, who wrote the first draft based on The Heart of Darkness, Coppola wrote the movie. Coppola's original idea wasn't necessarily to make a political statement with the movie, but to make a statement about humanity. This is evident when viewing the movie. It's not accurate in the technicalities. It's more like a drug trip through the war. Something which ironically is also something that was very common amongst the Americans during the war. Recent surveys estimate that well over 50% of the soldiers in Vietnam use marijuana. If the movie was trying to be straightforward, it wouldn't have confusing scenes, yet even though it does, those scenes do not feel as confusing as you'd imagine they'd be if they'd be out of context. You hear him out there on the wire, man? Yeah. I kill you, G.I. You need a flare? But seeing the movie through Willard's eyes, we understand what everything means. Which I might have to add here uh, is something that every movie should do, but Apocalypse Now is especially good at this, uh, because uh, well, have you noticed that you never really leave uh, the area that Willard would be seeing? So everything that Willard sees, the audience sees as well. It's a miracle that Coppola was able to make such a coherent movie out of all the material he had. Still, even if the movie isn't accurate, I can appreciate the backdrop of the movie and how it worked towards shaping a certain view of the Vietnam War scene in popular culture. There is an amazing channel out there that covers everything about the development of Apocalypse Now. The channel's name is Cinema Tyler. Every episode of the series is well crafted and new episodes are still being released. A lot of what I'm about to say is based on those videos, so please check them out. Apocalypse Now's development was notoriously hard for everyone involved. Constant storms raged in the Philippines during the shoots, some sets had to be rebuilt constantly, and even the choppers that they used were used by the Philippines to fight an insurgency in the country, so... They just had to repaint the choppers every time they used them and then they gave it, you know, back to the Philippines. More and more money sunk into a project which Coppola wasn't even sure of if, you know, he was gonna finish the whole thing. Marlon Brando had underestimated the weather and packed poorly, expecting a beach holiday. Not only that, but he also arrived late. Martin Sheen had a heart attack during his time in the Philippines and uh, his brother is actually the one doing some of the shots and the entire voiceover um, while Martin Sheen, first of all, he had, you know, he was recovering from the heart attack, so his brother did some of the scenes, but also the entire voiceover, Martin Sheen just had like a falling out with between um, him and Coppola, so uh, he just, you know, Coppola was like, hey, uh, hello, hello Joe, Joe, do you want to do this? He was like, okay. The scene where Willard is having a breakdown in the hotel room is actually Martin Sheen having a breakdown in a, a hotel room. Half of the crew lived like shit, while others, such as Coppola, had food imported all the way from Italy just to serve his tastes. Which is, ironically, just like in the movie, where the officers sit at a table having nice food while the grunts eat in the jungle. Some of the military advisors they brought on set, who had been actual veterans of the war, decided to live in the jungle near the sets. The movie would probably have cost even more if it weren't for the cheap labor that they could use in the Philippines. It already took a lot of Coppola's own money to make it happen. In the end, through all the pain and shit, Coppola was able to push out a movie. 
Willard is the most important person in Apocalypse Now. He is the story. We see his state of mind through how every location is filmed. During the opening, after Willard takes a drink, everything is very disorienting. At the table, the cameraman was instructed to pan away from something when he felt bored, which symbolizes Willard's boredom. Surprise, surprise. At the Dolong Bridge, the chaos of the battle is disorienting. Flashing lights everywhere, explosions, people begging to get out. At the end, we see the shadows representing the inner darkness inside every person. We see how Willard embraces it, just like Kurtz did. Kurtz had done everything in his power to be able to lead the fight on the field. He was being groomed for one of the top slots in the corporation. During the next few months, he made three requests for transfer to airborne training Fort Benning, Georgia. These design choices allow us to resonate with everything in the movie. Willard was fascinated by what Kurt saw in the war. He wanted to understand. Since we see the movie from his perspective, we understand him. This makes us want to know too, which in turn makes us explore our own inner heart of darkness. After watching the movie, you start to think, would I be able to do that? Ah, but Kurtz is insane. Or is he? It kind of makes sense, though. We train young men to drop fire on people. But their commanders won't allow them to write fuck on their airplane because it's obscene. A movie that makes you question yourself is already doing something right. The movie feels very claustrophobic. There are multiple scenes of the characters covered in sweat as the tropical weather makes the air heavy and hard to breathe. The only safety in the movie seems to be the tiny boat in the middle of a river, surrounded by thick jungles and trouble. The first encounter the men have outside the boat is already a sign of what would be to come if they exited the boat. It makes the location feel small and cramped. There is no choice but to go upriver. The characters are interesting too. Lawrence Fishburne had lied about his age to get in the film, which ironically is close to his actual character who is a young kid serving in Vietnam. Lance was the only one to survive along with along with Willard. Perhaps Kurt saw that Lance was living in his surroundings unlike the rest of the soldiers because he was high all the time. The actor who played him was also high during filming so a lot of the acting in this movie is not actually acting you know like um we previously talked about Martin Sheen's breakdown. Here's what I think the character deaths in this movie represent. Clean's death is the loss of innocence. Philip's death is the loss of order since despite Willard outranking him, he controlled the ship. Chef's death is the loss of all hope. Lance is so high off his mind that Kurtz did not bother. Kurtz's death is Willard becoming him. The movie creates a lot of contrasts. The boat and the jungle, safety and danger, the officers and the grunts, the good and bad deeds. Kilgore and Kurtz, victory at the expense of well-being or endless war to serve as entertainment. Literal differences in light and shadow. One interesting scene which was removed from the theatrical cut of the movie was the plantation scene. The French plantation owners that had owned the land since the colonial days were stuck to their past, unable to leave the land because of their own determination. The world was falling apart around them, yet they lived like they still owned Indochina, killing any soldiers that came close. It's not hard to see why they cut the scene when it comes to the tension during the movie. All of it breaks since Dolong was technically supposed to be the last civilized spot we saw before entering upriver into Cambodia. At Dolong Bridge, the enemy broke down the bridge every night only for the Americans to rebuild it by the next day. Soldiers stuck in an endless fight like Sisyphus. Endless suffering driving people mad. No commanding officers around. The poorest classes left on their own. This was also a good detail since it showed who really fought the wars. The rich could buy their way out of going to Vietnam, however the less fortunate sons of America served. Back to the plantation. The plantation scene shows that Willard can still love. At the dinner table, Captain Willard meets a young widow who lost her husband. Willard, as a divorced man, understands her on some level. They end up spending the night together. 
The whole scene is not only a showcase of the ghosts of the past that refuse to live in the present, but also Willard's other side. The one that loves. I want to talk about the soundtrack of this movie, specifically one song. The End. The End is a song released by The Doors in 1967. Morrison originally wrote the song as a breakup song, but it evolved from there. I think it's sufficiently complex and universal in its imagery that it could be almost anything you want it to be," said Morrison in an interview. The movie uses a slightly remixed version of the song. The movie's usage of the song definitely shapes the meaning to be about death, and in a very meta way about the movie itself. Not only does it play at two points where Willard's sanity is at its lowest, but also at the literal end of the movie. The end of the odyssey that the characters of the movie embark on, and the end of Kurtz's life. Let's take a quick visit back to Lieutenant Colonel Kilgore. Kilgore is a man who treats war like a sport. At one point he mentions how the war will be over, almost as if he wouldn't know what to do when it's done. Someday this war's gonna end. He lives and breathes killing and war. Compared to Kurtz, he seems more like a monster, yet Kurtz is the one that ends up being condemned by the US military. Kilgore kills civilians while Kurtz picks his targets very carefully. However, the US military wants to maintain order within a place that has no order. Kurtz understands that if one wants to win the war, he must adapt to the battlefield instead of trying to bring home onto the field, unlike Kilnor, who has barbecues with his men right after napalm striking and killing tens of enemy soldiers and civilians. Willard never seems to understand Kilgore. Willard's mind is always in the jungle, like we understand from the opening narration. He is already in the same mindset as Kurtz, but he doesn't understand it yet. By killing Kurtz, he becomes Kurtz. He finally becomes a savage. The further upriver they go, the more they stray away from the order that the US military and Kilgore are trying to establish in the middle of a war zone. Something that would never motivate the soldiers to understand their surroundings and win the war. Inside Willard, the forces of civilization and savagery fight. So do the forces of love and violence. This is what the inside of Willard's mind is like. The end credits have no music, just an ominous silence, which leaves the viewer questioning themselves. That's the beauty of Apocalypse Now, in my opinion. The movie makes you live it. I hope you enjoyed it. I had to get this all off my chest. And there's probably way more that I, you know, didn't mention or that I missed. Um, or stuff that I couldn't think of right now. Maybe one day this video will receive a sequel. Who knows? But hey, until next time. Red.